<laughs> What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. I'm Nicholas. That is my man Noah at FB God on Twitter. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. Make sure you're following my man at FB God on Twitter because he's closing in on a thousand followers. I think he's at eight twelve. We just did a live <laughs> a live check because we actually filmed the intro and then his dog wouldn't stop barking, so we had to refilm it. So we're not going to pretend like we're going to do a live check because we actually already know how many followers he has. We want to get him to a thousand before July nineteenth. I'm not sure yes. why. I don't know why July 19th is a hard date, but that's what we're going to push for. So I'm going to make sure that I include that in every email, every video, every tweet that I put out from now on. Go follow Noah. Today we're talking about bold predictions for the 2019 fantasy football season. We're going to go conference by conference. This Tuesday's video is going to be the AFC. Next Tuesday, we're going to dive into the NFC. Today is July 2nd, which means yesterday the Big Dogs draft guide went live. For purchase, bigdogdraftguide.com. Go check it out. Go cop so I can eat dinner tonight. I'll tell you <laughs> what, the bank account's getting low. The bank account's lower than, than Noah's follower count. Yeah. And uh, it's not a, that's not a pretty, pretty place to be in in life. So that being said, what's at the intro? All right, so with these bold predictions, Noah has about five or six, a handful of them that we're going to go through. He made one for every AFC team, which you could find on the blog post, but we're just going to go through his favorite ones. And uh, these are all his bold predictions, and then I'm basically going to listen to what he has to say and then tell him why he's wrong about his bold predictions. That's how this video is going to go. Noah, are you ready to get yelled at? Yes, I was born ready. Let's go. Let's fucking do this. All right, we're going to start off with the Pittsburgh Steelers, and – just to like start off, I just want to say these predictions are bold, but I don't think any of them are unreasonable because it's not fun to say, I think James Washington's going to catch 2,000 receiving yards and 18 touchdowns. Like That's not fun. You could have like facts all you want. It's not going to make any sense. So one reasonable bold prediction I have is Dante Moncrief leads the team in receiving touchdowns and by way of this becomes a top 24 receiver by year end. Wrong. Already? <laughs> 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 Expect that for, for every bold prediction. Continue. Well, yeah, it, it'll be wrong, but we'll, we'll make it sound good on the way to being wrong. So, yes. obviously, A.B. is gone. That's 169 targets gone, 24 of which were in the red zone. And obviously, red zone targets bring a lot more value than targets on, like, the 34-yard line because six points is going to be more than a 17-yard catch. And Juju Smith-Schuster last year had 29 red zone targets. So, even though A.B. is gone and he was their number one and Big Ben loves throwing to his number one in the red zone, it's not like we can expect that number to go up much more. I think Devontae Adams led the league with 31 red zone targets. So, yeah, even, yeah, so even, if, even if Juju is their number one, it might even regress a little bit with the lack of passing volume. And um, just because we're not sure if he can handle the coverage on the outside and for the simple fact that he already had all that volume. So with those 24 red zone looks from AB, you can expect a handful of those to go Dante Moncrief's way not only because they don't have like any other receivers, but the receivers they do have Deontay Johnson is five eleven, or I think he's six foot or five eleven, And then uh, James Washington is five eleven, And neither of them are red zone threats in their own right. And I know Moncrief has had like a troubled injury history and never really been consistent, but you look at the two years he had with Andrew Luck, he had 10 red zone targets one year and turned those red zone targets into six touchdowns in the red zone the year prior. He had 12 red zone targets and turned that into five touchdowns. Yeah. He was so I remember when he was with Luck, he was like a ridiculous touchdown scorer. And that was like his thing every year. It was like, you know, he doesn't even need to get that many targets because he's scoring eight touchdowns on 40 overall targets. And I guess with the bold predictions, it's like obviously anyone that you say is going to do well throughout the bold predictions, you're going to assume that they might be injury prone, but things will break right and they, they won't get injured that year, right? Obviously the bold predictions are not going to come true if they get injured, but we're going to assume that anyone on the list will stay healthy because otherwise – yeah, this would be no fun. Yeah. And on, to on top of, like, just the red zone looks where that brings a lot of value to him, Moncrief surprisingly had 21 deep targets last year, which is uh, targets of 20-plus yards down the field. And you look at the quarterback he was playing with or the quarterbacks he was playing with, he had uh, Cody Kessler and Blake Bortles. Now he goes to Big Ben, who loves throwing it deep, had the most deep touchdowns last year, 
And Moncrief's a guy with 4-4 speed, and he's a huge target. And I know James Washington in college had, like, crazy – like, a crazy yards perception mark. But with Moncrief's size and speed, it's a – like, he's a type of receiver that Big Ben hasn't had since, like, Martavis Bryant. Martavis Bryant's a guy who won deep down the field and won in the red zone. And uh, his best year in Pittsburgh, he didn't play a full season. But I believe he had uh, eight touchdowns, and he was, like, bordering that wide receiver to uh, – like that borderline of being a top 24 wide receiver. So I think if Moncrief even sees like 90 targets, if he catches 45 of those and takes them for like 700 yards and like 10 touchdowns, like a ridiculous Dante Moncrief-esque line, that could be good enough to bring him into a top 24 receiver. And I honestly don't think it's even that bold to say it. No, I, I think that's actually a good prediction. I mean, the only part I would highly disagree with is that he's going to lead the team in touchdowns because I'm a big believer in Juju and Juju had – seven touchdowns last year. And I've, you know, I've said this stat a few times this off season that Juju got tackled on two, two yard line five separate times last year. So that could have easily been double digit. And the year prior, he had, I think seven touchdowns on like half the number of targets. So typically he's a good touchdown scorer. Last year he got unlucky based on where he was tackled. But when you talk about the rest of the receivers there, Deontay Johnson, I just checked, he's 5'10", and James Washington is, is smaller too. So neither of them really pose a red zone threat. I think the biggest threat to, um, him as a player, Dante Moncrief, is actually beating out those two wide receivers. I think he will beat out them for the wide receiver two role. The question is, like, is he really the wide receiver two there, or are we just going to look back and be like, yeah, he had the most snaps and the most targets, but, like, is he going to be, you know, are, are them three going to get into this this role where they just shift around all the time? You know, in some games, uh, it's like the hot hand where James Washington will play the wide receiver two, and then he'll disappoint the following week and vice versa. But you made a good point on uh, – on the deep attempts. I didn't know that Big Ben led the league in uh, deep touchdowns because obviously um, what AB leads is not only a huge chunk of targets, but he was like the deep threat there, right? He scored so many deep touchdowns. And Juju is not, you know, people always talk about, oh, Juju's going to get the double team now. It's like that doesn't happen. No one gets double teamed. But what they do is they'll play safeties over the top. And Juju's not a guy that burns you with speed. AB is that guy. So uh, they do need a replacement for that. Well, I think Juju will get a, a ton of targets based on the target uh, hole that opens up with AB gone all of the deep targets that are super valuable will will have to go to someone and I don't think it's going to be Juju and uh, Dante Moncrief seems like a really good fit given his you know size speed and, and downfield playmaking ability so I kind of I like where you're at right here so I apologize for for telling you you're wrong <laughs> off the bat well there's like a 95 percent chance it's wrong but as you were saying like with the volume like he could be like in a mix of three different guys for the wide receiver two chair I, I'm just saying at season's end, I think he'd be a top 24 receiver because even if he gets like limited volume and limited opportunities, the targets that he's going to command, I think will be those targets that bring a ton of value, whether it be uh, red zone looks or just deep targets that could turn into touchdowns of like 50 plus yards. So I don't think he's going to need the volume. I think one year he had 30 catches and seven of them went for touchdowns. And obviously that's with Andrew Luck and that's like ridiculous efficiency. And that's like a Mike Williams type of finish. But I wouldn't expect – like, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a Mike Williams type of year. Like, last year we caught 40 balls and 10 touchdowns. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for that. I've been drafting a lot of Dante Moncrief in best ball and have pretty much completely avoided the rest of the wide receivers there. And, yeah. I mean, Vance McDonald is a big playmaker. He's, like, great after the catch and things like that. But we've never seen him be a red zone threat or, like, a guy that quarterbacks rely on in, in the uh, in, near the end zone. So, realistically, in the passing game, it's kind of just Moncrief and Juju at this point. So. Yeah. And one more big fact about Dante Moncrief, which I actually picked him up last year in one of my leagues because I play in, like, a deeper league. He, there was a six-game stretch where he topped 75 receiving yards four times. I remember that. He went off He went off a little bit, and people got excited. But at the end of the day, it was fucking Jacksonville. Yeah, and Dante Moncrief. But, yeah, all in all, he's not a bad pick in best ball, especially where he's going. He's probably, like, a 14th-plus-round pick. So uh, I, I'd be able to take the risk and take a gamble on Dante Moncrief. All right, bold prediction number one. I actually – I want to hear – I love asking people's bold predictions like on YouTube in the comment section because most of them are just fucking outrageous. But <laughs> I want to hear your guys' bold predictions. Let's let's stick with the AFC like we're doing for this episode. Drop some bold predictions down below. Give us a reason why. Like, because most people will just be like, oh, top five wide receiver oh, with no like logic behind it. So drop your boldest predictions that you could back up with some big facts and hit that thumbs up button while you're down there. And if you want to leave another comment to help us out, Rate these from 1 to 10 how likely you think that they are to hit, with 10 being the most likely. I like that. So we're off to a, a 10 for Dante Moncrief. Let's move on yes, to number yes. two. 
All right, next up, New England Patriots. There's a lot of Pats fans out there, so this could be a little controversial, but I don't think so because I believe that their third-round pick, Damian Harris, will lead the backfield in points scored in fantasy this year. And I have a little chart that I'm going to throw up, a game split about James White, where obviously he was awesome last year. Like, he Are we talk- talk- we're talking half PPR? What are we talking? Outright? Like anything? All, all formats. Maybe – no, no, no. Not, not full PPR. I was going to say, don't, don't go full PPR. Yeah, not full PPR. That's a little – Don't ruin it before you start. <laughs> yeah, somebody just commented one right now. But yeah. uh, uh, James White caught 87 balls last year. But if you look at his splits with and without Burkhead, it was eight games with him, eight games without him. He scored six less points with Burkhead and half PPR because Burkhead has a skill set where he can not only run the ball, but he's a solid enough pass catcher where – if it's third and long or even like third and short and you need a running back out there who can either catch the ball or run the ball, you can throw him out there where Sony Michelle was kind of like a, a crutch or he couldn't be relied on in passing down situations. He had like six catches all year. Damian Harris brings that same value where I believe he caught 22 passes last year in college and he was sharing the field with guys like Jerry Judy and um, even in his own backfield, uh, Josh Jacobs had over 20 catches. So he's a guy who can catch the ball out of the backfield take away from some of James White's snaps on those like third downs. And if you look at James White's snaps over the first 10 games, he played over 50% of the snaps seven times. He only hit that mark twice over the rest of the, over the rest of the season. And that's in part because of Rex Burkhead and also because Sony Michelle is doing really well. And um, Damian Harris on the ground is a much better runner than James White is. James White's never been like a ground and pound, like a grinder on the ground. And so for the fact that I think he can take James White off the field, he could outscore White, but that has to happen after Sony Michelle gets hurt. And last year, going into the season, Michelle had like a knee scope, and he was out for the first couple of weeks, and he didn't play in the preseason. He's already had another knee surgery uh, very recently. And during the season, he like hurt his back, and he's just been all type of banged up dating back to high school. He tore his ACL. So I think if Sony Michelle goes down, which I think sports injury predictor has like a 67% chance that he misses like six games this year, Damian Harris can step into that lead back role and he can take away snaps from James White where Sony Michelle wasn't taking from him last year. So, so I, uh, I don't, I don't think this will happen at all. I, I like the mock reform <laughs> better, but, but I actually, I do like Damian Harris and he may or may not be one of the sleepers in the big dogs draft guide. But I think, I think he has a, I think he has a path to <clears throat> fantasy relevancy without an injury to Sony Michelle. Um, it's, it's really interesting. I would love to know what happened in, in the, the front office of the, of the Patriots during this draft to make them think that Damian Harris in the third round was a good pick for their team. When I look at it, what it says to me is, like, not only does it provide depth behind Sony Michelle, because they took Sony with the first round pick last year. They take Damian Harris in the third round. Shit, my door's wide open, huh? Um, <laughs> hold on a second. I'm going <laughs> to So they take Damian Harris in the third round and not only does this provide depth for Michelle, but like think of his skill set and Rex Burkhead's skill set. They're pretty much redundant. So what I see is them bringing on Damian Harris, someone who can run the ball up the middle, run it outside if he needs to. He's quick within the tackles. He can catch the ball. He's a good pass blocker, which are all things that Rex Burkhead does, but Damian Harris is bigger, right? So it's like everything you'd want in a running back, but with more size. So if anything, this seems like it spells bad news for Rex Burkhead. And when you look at Rex Burkhead last year, he was playing plenty while Michelle and while James White were both playing. And like you said, like I I think at this point, like everyone has to be in in agreement that James White is a horrible pick where he is in terms of ADP. And the only reason he was anywhere near ranked where he was last year was because Sonny Michelle and Rex Burkhead missed so much time. But with Harris there, like you look at – Burkhead's touch totals I think he had individual game lines of like 15 touches 14 touches maybe like 19 touches and he had like 18 rushes one game yeah he had plenty of games where both of those other backs were in the game and he still got plenty of touches which is where I see Damian Harris progressing into the lineup more and we can't forget that like Sonny Michelle came into the NFL with two big concerns it was the knee and it was fumbling issues right and we forgot about the fumbling issues because it wasn't really an issue for him last year. Uh, if they spurt back up, right, he hasn't played that much on the NFL field over the last year or so because he's missed a lot of time. 
But if he won, like you said, he had a knee scope this offseason already, and he's dealt with a plethora of injuries. So if something does happen to him injury-wise, Damian Harris is going to take over a huge role in this backfield, and he's a much better uh, receiving back than Sonny Michel is. And you go back to the fumbling issues. If, if Sonny Michel fumbles the ball, Bill Belichick puts him in the doghouse, boom. That's another avenue for Damian Harris to get in there. So I think he's more than just a, like a late-round dart throw, hoping on an injury because of what we've seen out of Rex Burkhead. Um, he will have to beat out Rex Burkhead. But if, if he does and gets on the field, then I think he has like multiple ways of becoming relevant in fantasy. But I don't think he'll outscore. He needs a lot of things to break right in order for him to actually outscore those other two. But I see him at, at some point during the year, he will be in people's lineups. Yeah, that was a little bold of me to assume that all those dominoes would fall for him to get, like, all those touches. But I totally agree with you. He's quite disrespectful, to be honest. It is. Are you upset? Uh, I'm always upset. It was like I, – I believe he's, like, the most all-around talented running back in this backfield because he can catch the ball. He can run inside, outside. And I think the coaching staff will see that, where Sonny Michelle doesn't really bring as much value as he does on third downs. And he brings yeah. much more value than James White on the first two downs. So, um, yeah, I, I think he'll have a role – whether it be Sonny Michelle getting injured or not. And if he does get hurt, I think this bull prediction could hit. So that's where I stand with this. Next up, staying in the AFC East, my boy or your boy Spaghetti Anderson finishes as a wide receiver one this year in fantasy football. That might seem a little bold. I know he only had like 750 yards last year. But you look at the last four weeks of the season. I know, small sample. I'll, I'll hear you guys in the comments. But that was a sample size where Sam Darnold came back from injury. He was the number one uh, rated quarterback by pro football focus over that span. And obviously that's not like, there's no great correlation where if you're the number one in PFF, you're the best quarterback of all time. But it's, it's nice to know that he was doing, I don't know. <laughs> it's nice to know he was pretty some correlation there. <laughs> it's nice to know he was pretty good over the last four weeks. And we can safely say that he progressed throughout his rookie season. And over those last four weeks, Robbie Anderson was on pace to see 156 targets and turn those into 92 receptions, 1,344 yards, and 12 touchdowns. Obviously, these are really lofty numbers, and this would easily be like a wide receiver one finish. But you look at why he did so well in these last couple of weeks compared to what happened the rest of the season. He took he got eight red zone targets over these last four weeks. He saw at least one per week, and it's an average of two a week. And also, for the rest of the season, you know, Robbie Anderson's that guy who's going to win deep, and he's a deep threat. He had 30 deep targets, sixth most in the league. Only eight of them are catchable. Every single guy ahead of him had at least 14 catchable targets. And Sam Darnold, as I said before, like he struggled early on. But over those last four weeks when he was doing awesome, he had the ninth mo or the seventh most deep attempts and the ninth highest deep accuracy. So he was finally hitting on those deep balls. And Robbie Anderson was finding his way to the end of them. And it's not like he was playing terrible defenses. He played Buffalo and he played – It's I forgot who else they played, but it was a pretty good pass defense over that span. He, he showed he could be the number one on this team. And obviously they add uh, Jameson Crowder, and they already have Quincy and Nunwa, but they've only topped 100 targets once. And then the other piece of this offense that they added, and I know you guys are going to be yelling at me in the comments, it's Le'Veon Bell. But you look at how much Darnold used the running back position over those last four weeks. He averaged – he threw it to them 24 times, which is an average of six a game. For a full 16 seasons, that's 96 targets to the running back position. The most Bell ever had in a season is 106. So although all those aren't going to be directed towards Bell because they still have Elijah McGuire and Trenton Cannon if he makes the team. And they added uh, Ty Montgomery too. Ty Montgomery, yeah. But with him coming into a new system, Le'Veon Bell, and him not playing for a year, I wouldn't be surprised if he sees like 85 targets. And it's not too, it's not too bold to assume that uh, Anderson sees somewhere in the same realm of targets that he got last year just because – they were targeting the tight end. They were targeting the running back, and they were targeting guys like Jermaine Curse over that last span. So even if he gets, like, 120 targets this year, he has that boom potential to turn those into, like, 1,100 yards and double-digit scores. Yeah, that's my only concern is do we see him really get towards Andre? How many targets did he end up with on the year last year? Do you have that in front of you? Uh, I'm not too sure. I don't, he didn't play the full season, right, because he got suspended? Uh, check that did out. Did he not? Yeah. My, my, my concern, yeah, I think he missed the first two games with a suspension or something. Yeah, he had 93 targets, averaged 6.6 .6 a game. How many games did he play in? 14. Okay, 14 games, 96 targets, you said? Yeah, so 6.6 .6 a game times 16 okay. is... Well, I mean, that'll put him around 110. Um, and, yeah, I mean, the, the big thing here to take away is how, you know, him and Donald finished the end of the season last year with very good chemistry. It's, so, it's really hard to predict based on the small sample size you know over the last 
month or so because we see that a lot. We saw it was like Keelan Cole the year before that had such good chemistry going in. Um, with Anderson, I mean, one of my biggest concerns and probably the, the biggest concern is that Adam Gase is taking over as the head coach. And, like, he, his offense was just so bad in Miami. And, like, do we trust him to really be able to lead and, and make sure that Sam Darnold progresses as a good young quarterback? Because I think we've certainly seen that he's got the potential to be one of the better quarterbacks. But they also bring in Jameson Crowder. Like you said, they bring in Le'Veon Bell. We have Chris Herndon coming into his second year. He's suspended for the first, uh, I think, two games of the season maybe. Um, so, yeah. so, like, while it's not, like, all great weapons, there are a lot of, you know, weapons there between the wide receivers, the tight ends, and the running back who have potential at least. And, you know, adding time onto the backfield, maybe they use him split out a little bit more. Um, so my, my concern is the volume. But, yes, he is someone who, you know, makes those big plays downfield. My other concern is, like, is Robbie Anderson good enough to – assume like the number one role like can he have games where if he doesn't catch a 30 yard pass or a 40 yard pass can he have wide receiver one games or like top 15 top 18 games is he going to go seven for 75 and a touchdown right averaging 10 yards per reception um that's my concern is like can he can he do that consistently because you very rarely see a guy um outside of having ridiculously efficient numbers like a tyler lockett last year that aren't repeatable and aren't predictive crack that top 10 or that top 12 without being a true number one, right? And without seeing 130 targets and, and catching 85 of them or something like that. So uh, my, my concern is just that, like, we don't see consistent weekly play from Robbie Anderson. Yeah, and that's always, like, a big negative when looking at guys who rely off these big touchdowns. But he's also kind of heavily used in the red zone over the latter half of the year. And I know uh, Herndon is a bigger target, and Quincy Nuno has got a big frame to him. But if he's going to be used in this facet of the game next year, I think – his touch on upside alone is going to give him that top 20, like top 12 upside. I know it's very lofty, but he's only one year removed from a top 24 finish where he had uh, over a hundred, I think 112 targets. So um, yeah, he, just, he just makes me nervous. Like, like, I don't know if I want to draft him at all. I'm not avoiding him per se, but I'm not sure he's someone I want to target in, you know, the sixth, seventh round when you could be getting a top quarterback or like a, a tight end or something. So who would you wide receiver wise, would you take Robbie Anderson over Allen Robinson? Yeah. I was yeah. just about to ask you, would you take Robbie Anderson or Mike Williams? Um, I, I would probably take – I'm not even sure where I have him in my rankings. Um, Get the I, rankings at bigdogsdraftguide.com. Exactly. I haven't finished them yet. But it's just one more of the 19 things I have to do for the draft guide. Uh, I think Robbie Anderson will probably be ranked a little bit higher. So I'd probably take Robbie Anderson. Um, you would take Anderson over Alshon? Yeah, I would, I would take him over Alshon. What about Tyler Boyd? It depends how my roster is coming up, but I think if I want a safer play in, like, the sixth round, I'd go Boyd. If I want more upside, I think I'd go Anderson because I think Boyd is set to see, like, at least, like, 75 catches this year. Yeah, I, I would take Boyd there. What about uh, what about Calvin Ridley or Robbie Anderson? That's very close. And, like, every draft that I do on, like, draft.com, they're, like, always there for me, and I always – split in between them those two and Tyler Lockett I always have a tough time deciding I think Ridley's a safer option just because the offense he's in and we know what role he has yeah I was doing a write-up on Ridley today and I'm actually getting pretty high on him so I would take Ridley there uh Lockett's actually in his own tier above those guys for me I know he was like ridiculously efficient last year but um I I mean he's gonna move into the slot and even if they don't have a lot of pass attempts I I think he's gonna like see a much higher volume this year than most people expect. And I don't know if it's something that we're going to see continue, but I think it's almost going to be like not a one hit wonder year because he just had a big year. But um, I think we're going to see like a sort of explosion year out of Tyler Lockett, just based on the volume and the efficiency that he brings. But um, let's move on to the to the next one. Next up, we got little man out of Texas, Kiki QT uh, sophomore year. I think he has a chance to catch 75 plus balls this year. And you look at his numbers last year, he was obviously limited. I think he had hamstring injuries. Or... Is that the whole prediction? His 75 passes he catches? Catches over 75 balls, yeah. Okay. Um, you look at his numbers last year, he was actually on pace for 75 receptions, but he only played a small amount of games, and he's being drafted, like, really late. I don't know his ADP, but I guess it's, like, past wide receiver 40, 45-ish. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, yeah, he was on pace for 75 receptions. But you look at who he has – and on the team who's going to catch passes, obviously DeAndre Hopkins and have like a 30% market share and uh, get like 160 targets. And they don't have a pass catching running back per se, like Lamar Miller is probably going to get 30 catches, 35. No real tight end of consequence outside of their rookie. 
And then Will Fuller, and he's a guy who hasn't been healthy. When he is used, he doesn't quite get like crazy volume. It's more of those boom plays where he's actually been extremely consistent with Deshaun Watson, but you can't expect him to be a guy who gets 120 plus targets. Whereas for QT, or QT, I don't think it's too unreasonable to see him get over 100 targets this year. When he played on the field with Will Fuller last year, it was only four games. It was a four-game split with him and uh, two games without him. He actually outscored – he was actually better with Fuller on the field by over three points and was on pace to see 120 targets with Fuller. And I think part of the reason for this is is Fuller opens up the field for the rest of the offense to like spread it and run on vertical routes – where QT works in the slot, he had a 5.3 A dot, which is like one third of what Fuller got. And with Deshaun Watson having a terrible offensive line, Fuller is going to open up that defense and QT can get wide open underneath. And I just think that with his speed and his skill set and the type of offense that they run where Deshaun Watson might have to just uh, make quick dump offs half the time, I don't think it's unreasonable to see him get 75 receptions. And even if he does, like DeAndre Hopkins is still going to be an elite receiver and uh, Will Fuller is still going to get his looks, but QT could uh, easily see the volume to get to the 75 receptions that he was on pace to see last year. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm kind of all in on QT because, like, I, I mean, a lot of the production he had last year was based on the injuries there, but he was still very good, you know, in his own right. He had four games last year where he played over 45% of the snaps for Houston, and his per game numbers or his total numbers for those um, for those four games. 36 targets, so nine targets a game, 25 receptions, 270 receiving yards, and a touchdown. It's four games. If you pace it out to a full 16, that's 144 targets, 100 receptions, over 1,000 receiving yards, four touchdowns. And that does not include the monster playoff game they had versus Indy. 14 targets, 11 catches, 110 yards, and a touchdown. And during those games, that's a 28% target share. So he's on the field for 45% of the snaps, 28% target share. Um, and yes, like I said, the, the wide receiver group was banged up for most of the year, but either Will Fuller or Demarius Thomas was active for all four of those games that he put up those numbers. So it's like he will be, ha- he did have heavier usage depending on who was in and out of the game. But like QT came into the year, you know, banged up, right? He pulled the hamstring early on in the preseason. So it's like you can't expect him to get off to a hot start. He's a rookie and he played in seven games, including the playoffs. He had lines of 15 for 11 and 109 yards. Six catches, 51 yards, and a touchdown. Five for 77, 110, um, 110 yards, and a touchdown in the playoff game. So four out of the seven games, he had big games, right? That's four out of seven. That's over a 50% hit rate for a guy who came in injured as a rookie. So, like, I think QT is um, a much better receiver just, like, from a talent and raw perspective than people are giving him credit for. And this is, you know, this is a wide receiver. This is an offense that you want your fantasy wide receivers to be – tethered to right like if you're going to break a tie between wide receiver x and wide receiver y in your fantasy team the easiest thing to do is just look at the quarterback and Deshaun Watson has improved in his second year he's going to improve into his third year as a much better quarterback than when he came into from a passing perspective so give me the wide receivers tied to Deshaun Watson and QT is the the three if not the two yeah two other things that I just want to build off of this might go without like being said you brought up Demarius Thomas and Will Fuller. Those are two guys who don't have the same role as, well, Demarius Thomas isn't even there anymore, but those are two guys who didn't have the same role as Kiki QT. So even when Fuller comes back, QT has that role in the slot. Hopkins can work out of the slot, but he's an awesome receiver on the outside. He's probably the best receiver in the league. So it's not like he's going to be bumped off the field at any point. And the other thing I want to bring up is pretty much everything went wrong for Deshaun Watson last year, and he was still awesome. Like he broke his rib cage and like he had a collapsed lung. Like, he couldn't even fly on a plane for, like, an hour and a half. That's, like, something bad's got to be going on. And their offense line was awful. And, sure, their offense line might not be elite this year. They may not be even average. But with a healthy Watson and, like, a decent enough offensive line, or at least a little improved from last year, I'd, I'd bet on this offense throwing a bit more and being a little bit more efficient. So, um, yeah. that's I'm super high on QT this year. Yeah, uh, I think Deshaun Watson targeted the slot on over 20% of his throws last year, and Kiki QT was running like 75 to 80% of his routes on the slot. So that is his position. And the big thing is, it's like you can have three guys eat, right? Like in, in some, plenty of offenses, you have uh, a tight end, two wide receivers, or a wide receiver, a tight end, and a very good pass catching running back that all eat. This offense is all going to be going to their wide receivers because they don't have a tight end. They have, you know, uh, Warring, the third round rookie who I like, but like, Again, he's a third-round rookie tight end. Like, how, how how much production can he possibly put up? And they don't have a pass-catching running back that really makes the defenses worry. So, 
um, yeah, you could still see 65% of Watson's overall throws go to the wide receiver, 70%. And all three of these guys can, you know, play really well. Yeah, I think honestly, that's probably one of my least bold predictions out of this entire list. I think it's just one that I wanted to bring up QT and just shine light on how good of a receiver he actually is. Mm -hmm. Next up, we're staying in the division with the Indianapolis Colts. And I think Devin Funchess keeps himself within 20 half PPR points of T.Y. Hilton by year's end. And just throwing this out there, like a T.Y. Hilton-esque receiving line, would you be surprised if he catches 80 balls for 1,250 yards and six touchdowns this year? T.Y. Hilton? Yeah. No. That's basically what he had last year. So I'm just – we'll use that as, like, Hilton's, like, hypothetical finish for this year. That's 201 points. Okay. You look at what type of receiver Funches is, over the past two seasons, he's commanded 28 red zone looks. And that's with Cam Newton, and that's with playing 14 games and being limited over the last, like, four or five games last year where he really wasn't producing all that well. That's – so on average, that's 14 red zone looks a year. And obviously you say, oh, well, they have Eric Ebron. He's going to eat all those up. Who did they have last year to throw to in the red zone? Obviously, Eric Ebron's going to have like a 40% market share in the, on red zone throws because their tallest receiver is probably Chester Rogers, who has feet for hands. So it's like, go, <laughs> go Chester Rogers. Uh, but now they bring in Devin Funches, who's like a legit six foot five receiver who played tight end in college and has commanded and shown he's a good red zone weapon. He goes to be paired with Andrew Luck and, Obviously, Cam Newton's a very good quarterback, but Andrew Luck is elite. He threw 33 red zone touchdowns last year, and he had the third most attempts in the red zone. With these type of numbers and the offense that they're in, I would be surprised if Funches gets, I don't know, 19 red zone targets and turn those into like six or seven touchdowns. Like that's that's just being kind of not even bold. That's like kind of generous, to be honest. And just looking at the volume in this offense, last year Luck threw 639 times, and I know that's like a wild amount. That's going to go they, down this year. They're going to yeah. run a while back until they die. Yeah, and they were, but they weren't even like the pass heaviest team last year. It's just how efficient their offensive was. I, I'll say just because I already wrote it up, bumped the passes down to 600. So with 600 attempts, and let's say Funches gets an 18% market share, which is pretty much the average of what he's had these past two years. He had like 23 one year and 14 the other. An 18% market share on 600 throws is 108 targets. Two years ago, on 111 targets with Cam Newton, he put up 63 receptions, 840 yards, and nine touchdowns. You're being too generous. There's no way he touches an 18% target share in that offense. You don't think so? No. I think, one, I think that they are going to probably finish below 600 pass attempts. I, I really think they're going to be one of the more – they're set up to be – Yeah, like, they have a very good defense. They're, they're, they're going to have a good defense. That offensive line is so good, and I really think they're going to be something like – uh, who's a, like the, the Cowboys, how they set up their offense years ago. Andrew Luck's going to be so efficient this year because the running game is going to be so good. I think they'll probably be around like a 575 mark for pass attempts. And 18%, the problem with Funches getting 18% of target share is like that means he's outright the wide receiver too, like no questions asked. And they do have, uh, you know, Paris Campbell coming in there and Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle. I don't know what they're going to do with the backfield in terms of who's going to get the majority of the passing work. But I don't see a lot of – like Calvin Ridley last year, for instance, had 16% of the targets. And if you're going off like the average of, of Funchess' numbers the last two years, you said like 23%, 14%. One of those years was the year in Carolina where like every single pass catcher got hurt and he was like just fed targets from Cam. So I think, I, I think he'll probably be closer to the 14% than, um, than the 18%. Where I can't agree with you, though, is like the touchdown totals. I wouldn't be surprised if Funches finished with like nine or ten touchdowns this year. I remember – before I remember a tweet I put out like before free agency even started this year, so we had no idea where Funches was going. I was like, literally, the Colts should just sign Devin Funches and put, put him at tight end. put him at tight end. Like I'll never forget this because they signed him, and I'm like, yo, one of these tight ends is going to get hurt, and then Devin Funches is going to be used in the red zone at an absurd rate because that's all Andrew Luck does is throw to his big guys in the red zone. And like you said, though, Hilton doesn't catch touchdowns really outside of them being deep balls. Um, he does not throw to other wide receivers. Like Paris Campbell is not going to be a touchdown threat for Andrew Luck. It's going to be all Marlon Mack, and it's going to be all these tight ends. And now he's got punches there. So um, we saw what he did with Moncrief, right? Even Moncrief on a very limited number of targets in the red zone was super efficient with them. So why can't Devin Funches do what Moncrief did but have a more expanded role, right? He's still super young. We don't really know what his ceiling is. He hasn't played with a good passing quarterback yet. Um, so I think, I mean, like, yeah, I'm, I'm in on Funches too as a, uh, as a really, really good best ball pick. I think he's someone that will probably find his way into people's lineups in seasonal leagues this year too. 
Yeah, you hit me with a bunch of big fucking facts. Go. Let's fucking go. Let's and I'm kind of, go. I'm kind of spinning my head, just like <laughs> shoot my brain shooting around in my head. Just to finish this off, I had fun just for like a bold prediction receiving line is uh, 65 catches, 900 yards, and 10 touchdowns. Obviously, it's a bold prediction. He probably won't hit these numbers. But as you said, double-digit touchdowns isn't out of the realm of possibilities, especially because Eric Ebron caught 13 touchdowns on like a 50% snap share last year. Yeah. So, yeah, he's he's an upside play in almost all leagues, and especially in best ball where you can get him uh, very late. He's like pretty much going undrafted in half the uh, drafts I've done. I'm wondering where they're going to use him in the red zone. Like if, you know, Dante Moncrief was like a lob, a lob guy, right? You threw it up to him and given his size. He was able to just jump over cornerbacks. But Luck targets Ebron and, and his tight ends over the middle, right? You know, like they crash the seams where the linebackers and safeties are. So I'm wondering, like, if which way they're going to use Funches or if they're going to use him in both ways. Because that would be interesting because I think that way he could easily hit double-digit touchdowns if they have him running from the slot, you know, when they're in the red zone or if they have him going up for jump balls. Maybe that, like, jumbo package where they have, like, Hilton split out wide and they put in Doyle, Ebron, and Funchess, and they just have Funchess run, like, a little flat. and just... They should just put all three of them in a little, like, circle together. And, just <laughs> tuck it up and they and just have, have Jack Doyle catch 14 touchdowns this year. <laughs> yeah, we'll fucking throw it up. All the safeties are, like, 5'10". None of them can touch it. <laughs> I'd love that. Yeah. All right, last bold prediction. As Nick said earlier, you can go on uh, the site on the blog and see all my bold predictions that Big dog one of them might hit. Com. Yep, Big Dog's Draft. Or no, oh, I almost plugged that. <laughs> Big Dog's Draft. We got two different websites. Big Dog Draft Guide is where you get the draft guide. BigDogsFantasy.com is where the blog is. Yeah. So last up, we got the Denver, Denver Broncos. And I have a bold prediction that Cortland Sutton finishes the year as the number one scoring receiver in his sophomore year. So you look of, at the – Of the sophomore wide receivers. Yeah. I just wanted a little cliffhanger so people could pause the video and just get pissed at me. So, <laughs> you look at the other sophomore receivers heading into this year. We have Calvin Ridley and DJ Moore, who are pretty much consensus, consensus top 24 wide receivers. Um, and you'd obviously expect them to outscore Sutton. Even Christian Kirk and, like, Anthony Miller and Dante Pettis, they're getting a lot of hype. A guy who's kind of flying under the radar is Cortland Sutton, and he's somebody who caught seven or contributed 700 receiving yards last year on a pretty bad offense where – uh, Emmanuel Sanders got hurt, and, you know, they had Case Keenum throwing the ball, like, who's not an elite quarterback, but now they do have an elite quarterback in Joe Flacco. <laughs> but you, you look at how he was used. He only had eight red zone targets. Nick, take a guess at one receiver on the team who also had eight red zone targets. On Denver? Yeah, on Denver. Not Emmanuel Sanders. Tim Patrick. No, nah, well, I don't know. But <laughs> the one I chose <laughs> is Devontae Booker. And he had less than oh, Jeff yeah, Hyerman. I was going to go with Philip Lindsay, but I, didn't, I thought we were going with wide receivers. So you yeah. played me, and in turn, I played myself. Yeah, I hate, I hate Booker's him. kind of a receiver. He's more of a receiver than a running back in my book. Um, so, yeah, he, he's like fucking Mike Tolbert. If Mike Tolbert <laughs> <laughs> he's like Andy Janovich, like their fullback. Yeah. Like all these guys that Kyle used check. What the fuck is with these fullbacks? Like, right. <laughs> they got crazy names. They just, they're born from grit. Um, <laughs> so he, he wasn't heavily used in the red zone last year, but you look back at college and you just look at his metrics and his, um, his catch radius and just his size and his like elite agility at his size. He averaged 10 touchdowns per season. Technical difficulties. Um, where I left off was him in college. He averaged over 10 touchdowns a season over his last three years at SMU. And that was with sharing a field with Trey Quinn, who's, I believe he's like six foot two, and he had like a ton of receiving yards and a ton of receptions in college. So um, he has that like teammate score that people always talk about where he, he had competition. And along with him being probably used in the red zone more this year, which will obviously bring more touchdowns than what he had as a freshman, as a rookie, um, they bring in Joe Flacco, who hasn't always been the like pass happiest guy down the field. But you look at the receivers he's had, the only receiver that I can really remember other than John Brown last year, who was like a good field stretcher, was an old Mike Wallace and Torrey Smith. Mm -hmm. And when he had Torrey Smith, Torrey Smith, I think, had double-digit double touchdowns twice. And I believe one year he had 11 touchdowns. So, um, And last year with John Brown, a young receiver who could stretch the field, Joe Flacco was on pace for 91 deep balls, which uh, Cortland Sutton isn't the fastest guy, but with his like elite yards per reception of like 16.5 and just – having that size and being able to high point balls, I wouldn't be surprised in that thin air and mile high stadium that Joe Flacco just airs it out to him because he is like the, the thin air bullshit. <laughs> he is like the only receiver on this team who can stretch the field. I mean, 
Tim Patrick's like a freak athlete, but what has he ever done in his career? Deshaun Hamilton just works underneath. He averaged like seven yards per reception last year. And Emmanuel Sanders' Achilles tendons made out of like raw spaghetti. So I don't, I don't know if we can expect anything out of him this year. And just overall, you look at the volume that Denver had last season, 38.9 pass plays per game. And uh, Sutton had a 14.7% target share. Let's be a little generous, and hopefully this one works out in my favor a little bit more than Devin Funches did. <laughs> but if, if they throw 35 times a game and uh, Sutton gets a 20% target share, that that is a little bit high, but considering they don't have really any other weapons on the team, it's kind of reasonable. I can see it. I'll, I'll, I'll allow it. You'll allow it? Thank you, big fact. God. Uh, <laughs> that's an average of seven per game or 112 on the season. He's a type of receiver that doesn't need 140 targets to put up elite numbers. He only had a 50% catch rate last year. Let, let's bump that up to 55 because not only do I have that written down, but that's like Mike Evans' career average, and he's been below average his entire career in catch rate. If he has a 55% catch rate next year on 112 targets, that's 62 receptions. 62 times 16.5, his yards per reception, is over 1,000 receiving yards. I don't even think it's that bold that he gets 62 receptions. Maybe 1,000 is pushing it, but that's why he's included in this video. And with him getting more red zone looks and him being used in the deep game, I don't think like a 60 reception, 1,000 yard, and eight touchdown season is, like, isn't in his cards this year. All right. That's a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm deciding where I, want, where I want to start correcting you. Damn. One, Trey Quinn, 5'11", not 6'2". Yeah, Two. He was standing on a, on a little box. When really? So, yeah. only, so you got that hype, but you have the exclusive 6'2 hype from Drake Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to him. I talked to scouts. I saw his cleats. Just like Kyler Murray was 5'10". I, I'm pretty sure Kyler Murray is 5'7". I don't know how he fucking measured in at 5'10 at the combine. Yeah. And Fuck. people are saying he's a 4 3 one four because he ran five yards faster than Andy Isabella. I'm not buying that. No, nah, me either. I want to see it before I fucking claim that. Uh, number two, Torrey Smith. He did have one year of double-digit touchdowns. He had 11, so that was good. Uh, but Mike Wallace was at like four or five touchdowns yeah. throughout his time with Baltimore. With Sutton, again, it kind of goes back to one. Like, I think this, this wide receiver class that came in last year is really, really good. And it's going to be super underrated because they haven't had any, like, studs break out, like the OBJ Mike Evans class. But I think they're going to, like, make a very big impact on the NFL landscape for a long time. And I, I like a lot of those guys more than I like Cortland Sutton. And it just goes back to the fact that he's paired with Joe Flacco again. Like, if I'm looking at the wide receivers, I always want to go with the better quarterback. And you think of even Christian Kirk with Kyler Murray, who he's unproven, but he's still, in my eyes at this point in their careers, a better passer than Joe Flacco will be. And Matt Ryan with Calvin Ridley. You know, obviously I take the Falcons offense over the Ravens offense. Um, I mean, the uh, Broncos offense. And Cortland Sutton, I do think that he will take a nice step up this year. But, like, one of the problems I had with him coming out of college was, like, he, he could not separate from fucking anything. He was, like – he was stuck to defenders, right? You couldn't get him off him. And, like, with – you were talking about, like, Trey Quinn. Uh, Trey Quinn, like, outproduced Cortland Sutton that last year they were together, which is a little bit concerning. And when I look at the guys who come out as prospects, right, and they have all – they check all the boxes, right? They're good size, good speed, weight-adjusted speed score – young breakout age, good college dominator rating. The one common thing that I see between the guys that have all those things and end up busting is that they come from schools that are not in the power five. Like a lot of those guys end up flailing out because they play against less competition and it's hard for you to tell whether or not they'll be good against NFL type competition. Um, and Cortland Sutton obviously went to SMU and that was like one of my concerns. Like he couldn't separate from people that played in that conference. So like what makes you think he'll do it in the NFL? But 700 yards receiving for a rookie is, is pretty encouraging. And uh, any sort of step up will probably put him in the 900-yard range. I think he's like – he's probably two years out from being um, a real fantasy changer, in my opinion. Um, but I don't know. I'm just not as high on – he's not as someone I'm necessarily targeting in redraft this year. Yeah, admittedly, I'm not even a fan of him. Somebody actually asked me a question, like, would I rather have him or Kirk? And I said I'd rather have Kirk. But just I was going through teams and the Denver Broncos really didn't have anybody who sparked any interest. So I kind of looked into Sutton and just how he didn't really have much opportunity last year. And I think he will take that step up. Um, and I think he, he's a pretty good receiver just for the fact that he's athletic and he's big and he's the only one with that skill set on that team. Uh -huh. So I think I think like eight or more touchdowns isn't unreasonable. I think a thousand receiving yards is kind of lofty. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's like a top five sophomore receiver this year, like ahead of a guy like Christian Kirk or Anthony Miller. So. Yeah, I, th I think he should crack the top five. I also think that, like, people are getting super high on Deshaun, Deshaun Hamilton. 
Um, but I don't think they should be because Case Keenum's not there anymore. And Case Keenum was like the entire reason that everyone who ever played the slot with him got ridiculous target numbers. Yeah, and um, I don't think Hamilton got over 50 receiving yards. I'll look it up right now, but I don't think he topped 50 receiving yards. I was yards. looking at some of the efficiency numbers from him last year. He got the volume strictly because he was in that slot role. But if you look at any advanced efficiency numbers, like yards per reception, yards per target, you know, yards per – like everything, it was really bad. He ranked like outside of the top 70 wide receivers in almost every category. But people remember him getting like seven catches. He would literally finish games with like eight targets, seven catches for 34 yards. Which wait, is wait, cool. wait, I got it right now. Go. Nine targets, six catches, 40 yards. <laughs> 12 targets, seven catches, 46 yards. Like that's like his – that was his consistent game last year, and he's not getting those targets when Joe Flacco is the quarterback. I mean, they have Noah Fant coming in too. Um, I think they have multiple good pass-catching running backs. So Hamilton's volume is going to dip, which does give me a little bit more faith in like Corlin Sutton being the guy as a wide receiver. But don't sleep on Tim Patrick. He he was pretty good last year, even though he was an yeah. undrafted free agent. Um but I just – I don't know. I just don't think there's enough of like overall volume to go around to make any of these guys anything more than like a late-round upside flyer and none of, none of them that I'm targeting. Whereas the other sophomore wide receivers like a Christian Kirk or like a Calvin Ridley, I might be targeting in some of my drafts. Yeah. I think that'll wrap it up. Just a little, a little plug into the blog if you want to read a little bit more. I have – Full prediction for Miami Dolphins that Josh Rosen finishes a QB1 on a points-per-game basis. So if you want to read about how stupid I am, there he goes. There he goes. There goes that man again. <laughs> he doesn't like the big facts hitting his earlobes. Fucking blasphemous. <laughs> if you want to read about, like, how I can kind of contrive, like, a bunch of fake stats into, like, an argument, you can check it out on bigdogsfantasy.com. There yeah. we go. There we go. <laughs> After two years, you're learning the website. I'm proud of you. Yeah, so that's going to wrap up the video. Make sure you check out Noah's full blog post at BigDogsFantasy.com. Make sure you cop the draft guide, which is out right now at BigDogsDraftGuide.com. It's got the sleepers. It's got the bust, the must draft players, all of our rankings, plus a million other fucking cool tools and other exclusive pieces of content that we have there. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you give that thumbs up. Share with your friends. Make sure they're not in your league, though. And subscribe to the channel if you are new. Drop us some comments down below for the YouTube algorithm. And that's all for this week. We'll see you right here next Tuesday. Peace. Peace.